Hello and welcome, it's here, my review of Hogwarts Legacy. In this video, I'll break down the highly anticipated wizarding adventure into what I like to call the 10 pillars of gaming. As always, if you like this video, please do hit subscribe. I'm just a gamer making these videos on my own and any support is hugely appreciated. Like all my reviews, this will be spoiler free. All subtitles have been blurred out and I'll only use very early game and trailer footage. At the end of the video, we'll have a score for this game out of 100 and be able to answer Hogwarts Legacy. Should I buy it? The story. The most important pillar of a video game for me. Does this game boast a good story? Well, I'll be honest, this was the part of the game I was most apprehensive about, as the best story from this world has already been told with the much-loved Harry Potter series, and I always get a bit concerned when a brand new story is written to exist in an already loved world. However, it kind of works. The main thing for me is that it doesn't feel forced. You don't get the sense that Porky Games said, hey, let's make a Harry Potter Potter themed game. Don't worry about the story. We'll cross that bridge later, even though that's probably how it worked. The story feels well written and one that could have existed as a book beforehand. It starts strongly and throws you straight into an intriguing and mysterious plotline, but it's not perfect. There's a real lull in the story about five hours in. I found myself really struggling to motivate myself to play the next mission. However, if you power through those bland filler missions, you get to a really nice second half of the story, which culminates in a strong and satisfying ending. I talk a lot in my reviews about that moment you feel after a game finishes and how it affects you as the credits roll. Sometimes there's tears, sometimes there's shock, sometimes there's even anger. In this game, there was kind of nothing. It was just, you know, a suitable ending, if not slightly predictable. I just sat back in my chair and went, ah, that's the end then. The basis was strong and contained some real high points, but its slow tempo in the middle parts really held it back. Seven. Setting. Now we arrive at the big sticking point in this game for me, and I want you to hear me out properly on this. I'm part of the generation which grew up reading and watching Harry Potter, so I couldn't wait to explore this world that has played such a big part of my childhood. And yes, it's stunning. The castle is beautiful, and those first few hours are such a genuine joy. I was just in awe at the designs and spent most of my time pointing out locations from the film and the books. Hogsmeade is equally impressive and feels so magical, no pun intended, but I'm sorry, that's kind of where the good points end. Within the first 10 hours of the game, you soon realise it's actually pretty lifeless. Walking around the castle gets bland very quickly due to the same repetitive conversations that you hear. When you're past the initial exploration stage of the castle, it just becomes a bit of a chore walking around it. And then we move outside. Now, the map is really huge and is kind of broken into two main parts with the second coastal area being more accessible as the story progresses. The Forbidden Forest looks great, but really doesn't seem that dangerous. In the films and books, this place genuinely seems scary and places that you really shouldn't visit. But I never really had any hesitation to enter at any point in the game, even at a low level. Also, the wilderness area is just barren. Yes, there's puzzles to solve and chests to loot, but that quickly becomes very repetitive. The villages and hamlets are picturesque and quaint, but do all look a little bit similar, and despite the odd quest giver, there's not much to do there. I always ask myself when making these review videos, how often did I fast travel? If the answer is a lot, then that normally means that the world wasn't interesting enough to manually travel. Take an example I use often, but Red Dead Redemption 2. The world was so wonderfully populated with events, mysterious things to find, and ambushes that I hardly ever fast traveled because manually traveling was so rewarding. I'd say I opted to fast travel almost all the time in this game, which some people may argue is due to the flying elements, which we'll get onto, but it just felt really flat. 
To end with a more positive note, the seasons do change within the games to reflect the advancement of time within your school year, which was a really nice touch and the winter season especially looked beautiful. And one of the more beautiful elements was the Room of Requirement, which initially is locked until you further progress in the story, but this offers your own space and is completely customizable. Overall, imagine a huge, beautiful mansion, but you go inside and there's like no furniture. That's how this game felt. And that's a shame because the potential was there to make it so much better. Six, characters. Let's begin with the negative, but don't worry, we'll improve. The playable character for me wasn't great. You obviously choose between a male and female build and the customizations of looks was pretty good with some decent options. I played as a male, I considered female, but females have a very masculine look about them in this game, almost like the developers just made one body type concept and allowed you to change the hair and face. So opting for a male, you can tweak your voice by increasing or decreasing the pitch, but in truth, it doesn't make a positive impact. It just sounds really odd. Now, if you love Harry Potter, and not just the story, I mean actually Harry himself, then you'll probably love your playable character because it feels like that's exactly who Portkey Games were trying to create. You're a very polite and well-spoken young man, which is fine, but in a game that does allow you to shape your wizard into the type of wizard you want to be, for example, whether you learn and use unforgivable curses or not, it would have been good to have other voice options. Naturally, like most gamers, I I was casting Avada Kedavra every 10 seconds in this game to then hear a voice like this. I enjoyed that. It just broke the immersion a little bit. Voice acting on the whole in this game is pretty weak. There's some good performances, but there was a bit of a jarring and robotic feel about it. The conversations just didn't fluidly flow like they do in some games. Now, as for the rest, they're pretty solid. There's a core of three to four students who I'd class as main supporting characters, with three of them offering their own quest lines, which were all actually really good and possibly more engaging than the main story, certainly in parts. Each of these students have a good backstory and their story arcs within the game are really quite interesting and impressive. Your journey starts with Professor Fig, who first takes you to Hogwarts School. He plays a big part in the game's story and was a well-constructed character. As for enemies, there's two main ones, and as with the nature of RPG adventure games, the bad guys don't actually get that much screen time until the end parts of the game but when they both were on screen, they really stole the show. Don't expect anyone quite as menacing as Lord Voldemort or as dark as Gellert Grindelwald, but you will grow to hate the main antagonist. Despite the main story naturally being more based outside of Hogwarts school, you do form attachments with your peers and do find yourself deeply invested in their own lives and stories. It's just a shame that the voice acting wasn't that great. 7. Gameplay Okay, now we're cooking. I loved the gameplay in this game. Being a witch or a wizard is fun, right? I used to pretend to be one as a kid watching the films, and even today, in adulthood, I still have to fight the temptation to cast a spell when holding anything that resembles a wand. But Hogwarts Legacy surpassed my expectations. The dueling element in the game is especially fun and actually a bit more complex than I expected, but in a good way. I thought it would be a bit button mashy, but it's not. The game actually allows you to build your wizard how you want and you unlock spells as you progress. Spells are then highlighted in different customizable button slots so you can work out your favorite spells and which combos work well and plan your combat around that. As we all know, unforgivable curses do exist in this game, but they do have a cooldown feature, like most spells, but more significantly, meaning you can't just cast the killing curse on everyone, as that would make the combat pretty boring and pretty easy. On top of the spells, you can use herbology items such as mandrakes, venomous tentaculars and more to defeat your foes and potions that you make which improve various areas of your combat. Flying is a bit of a contentious one. I've read a lot of gamers disliking this element. For me, it's not quite as bad as some people make out. The controls are easy enough to use, but I do get the point of people claiming that broom travel is too slow. 
Although you do cover a lot of ground quite quickly, suggesting you are actually going pretty quick, it doesn't feel quick, which was frustrating. You can also fly a Hippogriff too, which is cool, but ultimately no faster than your broom. You could choose some dialogue responses, and although this isn't a game where the choices really impact the story, this was quite a nice addition and helps you forge your character in the style that you want. I wasn't quite Tom Riddle, but I wanted my guy to have a bit of a darker edge. And no, you can't kill your fellow students, although there were many that you'd want to. You can be a bit dark in terms of your responses. Some side quests can see you track something down for an NPC, such as a pet or a family heirloom. You can then have the option to return to the NPC with the item, but tell them that you've actually decided to keep it for yourself. Crafting is a big conversation. You can't outright craft clothing, but that's never really an issue as you pick up a lot of new outfits in this game. A nice touch is that if you like the stats of a certain piece of clothing, but not really the aesthetics, then you can make any piece of clothing look like another piece of clothing. This is not so clearly explained in the game, so I did do a little explainer video on how to do this, which you can watch up here. Clothing can be enhanced with traits and upgrades, but that is locked to begin with. Earlier, I mentioned the Room of Requirements, which becomes available probably a quarter of the way into the game. This is your own customizable area, which you can use to grow plants, brew potions, and home your beasts that you collect in the world. The space's aesthetics can be changed to suit the gamer, and structures can be built. It's not quite The Sims, but it's a nice mechanic and can provide a much welcome break from exploring and the main story. You can customize your wand once you purchase it, although I found the options a little bit underwhelming. And strangely, you can't customize your broom, although there are several preset models that you can buy. I do wonder, however, if that's going to be something which will be explored in a DLC, especially if it's a Quidditch-themed DLC like we're all expecting. And on that note, this is of course well documented, but just in case you didn't know, Quidditch doesn't feature in this game and the story explains why. On the whole, the gameplay is really fresh and strong. You'll run into a lot of enemies in this game and you never really tire of fighting them. Once you unlock more spells, it becomes even more fun. The only reason this isn't a perfect score is the pretty lackluster flying. 8.5 Visuals The footage you're seeing now is captured on a PS5, so naturally, PS4 or Xbox One players can probably expect a slight downgrade from this, but it is stunning. I'd never really been into gaming photography before, but on several occasions during this game, I had to take a screenshot of what I was seeing. Hogwarts Castle especially is stunning inside and outside, and there's a lot of beauty around the world too, mixed in with obviously some very dark themes. The aforementioned Room of Requirement boasts some of the cleanest visuals that really are striking. Game cutscenes follow suit and, well, just look at it. Well-detailed face animations mixed in with some really vibrant colours made it a really enjoyable experience. One small gripe, and it is very small, gameplay conversations can sometimes be a bit jarring, in the sense that on more than one occasion, an NPC gave me some bad news, such as, oh no, my dad is dead, and it would then cut to my character with the biggest smile on his face. I'll be honest, it made me laugh more than it did anything else, but it was just a bit immersion-breaking. To summarize, this is stunning. The little opening sequence here really does showcase just how beautiful it is. And to be honest, from this point, it just gets better and better. 10. Bugs. Normally a nice short category, except for my Cyberpunk 2077 review. Are there any bugs in this game? There are a couple, but I'm giving port key games the benefit of the doubt that I played this game from release day and that most early bugs and issues have already been resolved in the most recent updates. The biggest ones seem to be characters' faces changing within gameplay, weirdly more so with female characters, but again, that seems to be altogether gone now. I didn't experience any crashes and no storylines or quests were broken. It scores 9. Length. How long is Hogwarts Legacy, and is that a good length? Well, really, this game is as long as you want it to be. 
There are a lot of side quests and collectibles to keep you entertained post main story and an endless amount of time to be spent in your room of requirements. But for the main story alone, it's going to take you around about 30 hours, maybe 35. And as my girlfriend always says to me, that's a pretty average length. It didn't feel too long, but because of my earlier point regarding the story, I think some of the bits of that lull period could have been cut out, taking the story to more of a 25 hour mark. But it definitely didn't feel too short. 9. Fun! Is this game fun? Of course it is. I've dreamed about being a wizard since I was a little boy, and this, so far, is the closest I've got. I don't know why I'm saying so far as if I'm ever going to actually get any closer. The combat alone makes this a really fun journey, and despite the bland, empty feel of the world, there is a lot of variety in terms of how you want to play. Sometimes you might be in a mood to do a bit of collectible hunting and puzzle solving, and although, in my opinion, these do get boring pretty quickly, they can be fun in short bursts. 8.5. Replayability. A word I think I might have made up, but in every review I do, I discuss whether you'd play this game again, which I think is an important factor when deciding whether to buy a game. There's lots of reasons to play this game again, and although the story is maybe not one that you'll suddenly get an urge to revisit in a year or so's time, there are reasons to suggest your next playthrough would be different. At the beginning of the game, you choose which house you'd like to be sorted into, which grants you access to that house's unique common room and house-specific side quests. I have no doubt you will research which house you want to play as. I was a sliver in, but I will definitely try something new next time. It's also a game I intend to keep popping back to just to slowly make my way to 100% completion. The house element on its own means there's at least four unique playthrough opportunities. Nine, value. This is always a difficult category as, you know, it's subjective to what it's currently valued as right now, as this at the time of releasing is freshly out. I paid full whack and I don't regret doing so. Although, as we can tell, this game is far from a masterpiece, it's still absolutely worth paying good money for. And if you've ever watched one of the films or read any of the books, you will just love it purely for the nostalgia element. Given how well this game has sold already, I can't anticipate a price drop anytime soon, but if you're not keen on paying the very expensive price that we all know newly released video games are these days, then check out psprices.com and add this game as an alert to be notified of when it drops. And don't worry about the title, that website also covers Xbox as well. But for what you get, I would say it's worth full price. Seven. And there you have it, my scores for Hogwarts Legacy according to the 10 pillars of gaming. Should you buy it? Well, ultimately, that's for you to decide from the evidence that I have presented you with. If you do buy this game off the back of my review, then please let me know in the comments. And of course, please let me know if you disagree with any of my scores. I don't claim to be an expert. I'm merely an honest fan. And one of the reasons I make these videos is to spark conversations between gamers in the comment sections. So just keep it polite, but get involved. Thank you so much for watching. And if you do have time to hit subscribe, that would massively help my small channel grow. Thank you.